All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's Aaron and Kurt, and we are back for another week of the Sore Echo series today. I will be doing the talk. So if you want to, like, uh, you know, just disappear real quickly, we'll pretend that you won't hear. But we're going to be talking about uh, treatment of ADHD, comorbid with substance use disorders, which uh, I'm thankful we have at least one psychiatrist on today to weigh in when we're when we're done. So uh, that'll be today's talk that we we'll do in just a moment. So we have a medication for opioid use disorder boot camp coming up on May 7th, located in Waite Park, which is the same thing as St. Cloud for those of you that aren't super familiar with the area. And this is really um, targeting and the intended audience is law enforcement. So sheriffs, jail administrators, law enforcement leadership, and correctional health care. Um, it will be dealing with some of the intricacies that all the correctional folks deal with on a daily basis. So we'd love it if you join. Registration closes, I believe, on April 29th. So if you have interest in coming or have any questions, please let us know. Yeah, and there's still openings, huh? Because I know there's quite yeah. a few people. I don't think we put a limit on, so the more the merrier. Okay. All right. Well, upcoming, uh, because of some scheduling issues, I'm going to come back and talk next week. And I'm actually going to be giving a talk on marijuana kind of clinical considerations when you have patients using marijuana uh, who are patients of yours. Because it's, there's just so many things to think about with drug interactions, adverse things, uh, just so people have a good idea. The next week following that is actually Elizabeth... Salisbury, and she's a harm reduction doctor from Madison, Wisconsin. I saw her speak at the national meeting, and she is coming to talk with us. So uh, she's going to be a, a wonderful speaker. So and I think, well, isn't Charlie coming back? Yep. Uh, yeah, Charlie's coming back the week after. The Charlie. The Charlie Resnikov. The Charlie. All right, there is free CME with these sessions if you are attending them live. So we love to see your faces and creep on what you're eating for lunch. So please keep your cameras on and feel free to interact. It kind of makes it more interesting and fun. Um, make sure you fill out what Katie sends out following these sessions in order to claim your CME. Yeah, and since I'm talking, you really should turn on your thing because I need I need the support. All right, next slide. Next slide. Uh, remember, if you have any questions, please call. We've had a lot of I've had a lot of great calls lately, so um, just get a hold of Aaron, email or phone, or else give me a ring. We're happy to help you with that tough patient. Um, I, and again, most of the calls we get are pretty interesting, so yeah, keep them coming. We are the home, Stratus Health is the home for the core website, which is a lovely culmination of a lot of policies, protocols, things like that to help you in planning and implementation of your program. So we always say don't reinvent the wheel because that can be time consuming and stressful. Check this out and hopefully it'll meet some of the needs. All right. Uh, you probably want to put up, is this the actual slide deck, Katie, or do we need to? Oh, it is. Jeez, she's pretty organized. So today what we're going to do, uh, this is a talk that I, I gave at a different conference um, a while back. And I, um, I I actually pulled this talk together because it really is something that we see so often uh, in our addiction clinic. And I my, my, my old partner, uh, Dr. McClure, is on, uh, who's a psychiatrist as well. And, and I mentioned to him at the start of this, I'm hoping that when we're through, he maybe kind of weighs in on some of his thoughts as well. Uh, but this is always a difficult thing. And if you're doing buprenorphine in a clinic, this is going to be when patients are in recovery, uh, they're going to come to you and say, hey, what about treating my ADHD now? Can I get back on my stimulants? And and so we're going to have to, you know, sometimes have these conversations. And these are really uh, these are sometimes really difficult conversations. And, and often these are patients that have also, also used stimulants or had uh, significant uh, use disorders with stimulants. So at what point do we put them back on? Some of the objectives, I think it's really important for us to understand, and I'll talk about this, that ADHD is actually, a, it's a real illness, right? With associated morbidity uh, and mortality. And and it's actually quite prevalent in, in this, um, uh, in ADHD patients with substance use disorders. Uh, we have to understand that this is kind of a bi-directional thing. And we want to also understand that that recognition 
of some of the risks of treating these patients uh, can be improved. And we want to, again, we want to affect their employment, their accidents or mortality, their relationships. And, and we always want to try and improve that. So, so is this the way to do that? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Next slide. So again, it's important to understand that ADHD is real. And, and again, there is clearly associated mortality with it. Uh, patients often are very impulsive. And again, with the accidents, uh, with their history of unemployment or difficulty holding jobs, uh, they often have very tumultuous relationships. So lots of things going on. And when we look at, at how common it is, I think that's one of the issues that we, that we know in adults that a certain percentage of people are going to continue to have troubles uh, as they age. And roughly, you know, it's probably in that range of 5% or so of adults actually would qualify uh, with very careful testing for ADHD. Now, if we look at patients that we're seeing in our clinics who have substance use disorders uh, and, not, and not just opioid use disorder, all the substance use disorders, their, their rates are probably much closer to three times higher than the average adult as far as having ADHD. So this is a, a very high risk group. So uh, understand that these are the, the patients that we not only need to kind of consider whether we would treat them and really what is the, what are the risks associated with it. Next slide. So we're not gonna talk about the substance use disorder patients right away. We're just gonna talk about the regular patient, about can, can we very easily diagnose somebody with ADHD when they're an adult, and and that's uh, really part of the part of the issue. I think that if you look at what happened during COVID, uh, so many things went online, and we had uh, many many people uh, call and get appointments for attention issues. And in fact, the rate of, of prescribing of stimulants actually went up about twenty percent during COVID. Uh, and we, if you think about why, well, often we had these these high schoolers and, and other people that were trying to do their job or their school online. And if they felt like they couldn't uh, focus to get it done, uh, they were calling to get a stimulant. Um, now there's ways of doing this. And sometimes it's just people at some of these different sites will just have these checklists. Now we have to understand that just because you can check a box of some of the symptoms of ADHD does not necessarily mean that you have ADHD because there's so many other things that can give you inattention. And number one in that group is would be a, having a substance use disorder. Um, obviously, other things like having poor sleep, uh, people with sleep apnea, they, they have concentration issues during the day, and patients even with PTSD. So there's just many other things we have to consider when we think about inattention. There's no simple diagnostic test uh, there's there's nothing that's 100% every time. This isn't like doing a strep test when your kid has a sore throat, where it's a positive or a negative. There's just a ton of gray. Um, and, and one of the things we always have to understand is that the criteria can be so easily found. Any one of you could right now say, I, I feel like I have bad attention and Google it, and you're going to get all kinds of things that tell you, uh, hey, do you have this, this, and this? And uh, then you would uh, you would say, oh, I need an appointment so I can get some stimulants. Uh, and in a way, it's become kind of a popular thing. I, I think there is not a day that goes by in my clinic that I don't have a discussion about ADHD. Next slide. So if we think about ADHD being something else, um, you know, let's just kind of dig into that a little bit with some of the studies that have been done looking at that very thing. Now, again, we talked earlier about ADHD persisting into adulthood. And I think that if, again, depending on the study, anywhere from roughly five to 20% of, of kids with ADHD will have it continue on into their later life. There have been a number of studies who that have looked at uh, and really clarified whether or not somebody has ADHD if they've been diagnosed after the age of 12 which frankly is in my clinic very common, uh, where patients uh, went and saw somebody in their, they're already in their 20s or 30s, 40s and 50s and were diagnosed with ADHD. Uh, the three studies, there were actually three different cohort studies that were done over a four year period of time and they did a, a little meta-analysis looking at these. And in the one study they found that of those uh, patients 
who thought they had ADHD, 55% of them actually they felt the cause of their attention issues was actually a substance use disorder. The other two studies found di other diagnosis in all but 2% of the patients being evaluated for ADHD. And so they found all kinds of other reasons that these patients had inattention uh, when they really looked at them closely and put them through a very rigorous uh, diagnostic testing. Next slide. So I think the big takeaway from this and from these studies is that if generally, if a patient does not have a childhood diagnosis or a very obvious history of suggesting ADHD as a child, it's, it's more often than not that you're probably treating something else. And I think that, that that's often the thing that we have to consider is that the older you are when you get this diagnosis, the more likely it is that it may be something else. Next slide. And again, as, as so far, we're just talking in general about patients who are just adults who are getting this diagnosis. So there's more too. There's other things that, that make the diagnosis difficult. And I think one of these things is, and, if, and when you think about even working in a family medicine clinic, people exaggerate their symptoms when they come in a little bit, right? They don't want to come in for a sore throat and have you say, no, I think it's a virus. They want to impress upon you how bad it is and how, how much trouble they're having. Uh, hoping that they're, you're going to give them that medicine. Like back in the 70s, everybody just get a shot of, of penicillin or Linkison, right? Linkison was still in my clinic when I showed up in, in 1990. I frankly uh, didn't even know it existed. Um, but when we talk about patients who have ADHD, uh, some of the evaluations and some of the studies have shown that roughly 22% of people admit that when they went in, they kind of enhanced it a little bit because they really felt that they needed they needed treatment. It's, it's not that they were being dishonest. They just really felt like they, they needed that medication to, so that they could study better or they would be better at their job. Um, and so, you know, as well, we, we certainly find people who prep for their evaluations to obtain stimulants. And they've actually done some really interesting studies where they've actually taken the undergrads and coached them the things to say and then sent them into clinics to, to see whether or not they were diagnosed with ADHD despite not having truly having those symptoms. So we know that, it, that it's very easy if you really feel like you have a, a problem that you can enhance what, what you're feeling and, and potentially be treated. Next slide. Uh, and I guess the question is, is, should we care? I mean, would it be better to just give everybody a stimulant uh, and hope that the people that really needed it got taken care of? And if some people got the stimulant and really didn't need it, what's it going to hurt? Um, and I think we've used that uh, same kind of thinking uh, with the antibiotics in the in the past. And as we can see is what's going on with antibiotics over the last 20 years, it's really caused quite a problem because there's adverse events there's resistances to antibiotics, and we really want to make sure that we know what we're treating, right? Um, and, and really with the stimulants, the biggest issue is it does cause a lot of adverse events. Uh, it causes hypertension, tachycardia, obviously the weight loss, all these different things, arrhythmias and stroke. Uh, and, and often I think people look at, look at people with psychosis or people who develop mania, on methamphetamine and think that this can't happen with things that we prescribe. But in fact, with higher doses, these things also can occur. And so it's not like we are giving people medications that potentially aren't going to cause them a problem. Now, obviously, diversion is a big thing. And I don't think any of us have probably not seen a patient whose first experience with uh, Adderall or one of those types of medications wasn't at a party or was it a, you know, was it a party? I mean, I frequently hear patients say, you know, I I was, one of my friends gave me a, an Adderall and it's the best I've ever done in school. Uh, or I, I did it once at work and I couldn't believe how much more I got done. And so the, the amount of diversion that we see with it is really pretty substantial. Um, and probably the last thing we should care, last reason we should care is we can cause a stimulant use disorder or we can reignite the stimulant use disorder that they have. And I think probably the last part of that is the thing that in the in the addiction clinic that we are concerned about the most. Um, I worry about giving any controlled substance to somebody who's had any substance use disorder in the past, because I, what I don't wanna do is derail their recovery. And I think often uh, that's the biggest worry 
even if they've not previously had a stimulant issue, are we going to give them another another issue? Remember, the most common or the most predictable thing uh, as far as developing a substance use disorder is having a previous one. So every su other substance we've put in there uh, can, can somehow cause issues. Next slide. So how about how we treat this or if we treat it? Do we do we need to think a little bit about what we're using and and why why we're using it and how much we're using? And one of the big issues in this uh, in, entire topic is really uh, who's doing the research on this. I watched a talk last year at the ASAM meeting in Washington D.C., and they had an entire talk on ADHD and whether or not we were creating another opioid crisis with the stimulants. Uh, and one of the reasons for this discussion was that so many of the ADHD researchers have received funding from, from, from Big Pharma. And in fact, so much so that even when we look back six or seven years ago at the Cochrane Review on adult methamphetamine use for ADHD, they actually retracted the review because people complained that the people that had done the review had conflicts of interest because of the money they were taking from different companies making the stimulants. So you know, we have to understand that that there is a big push by pharma to make this very much a mainstream disease. Um, and of course, just like with the opioid use uh, that we had in the patients with chronic pain, we had advocacy groups and, and they can be good and they can be bad, but they are also funded by the pharmaceutical companies. And lastly, of course, the marketing to physicians has been uh, huge. Uh, much like with the opioid crisis, uh, all of the drug reps that we had in our offices uh, telling us how we needed to treat pain and how, how we could really improve people's lives. Uh, very similarly, we're seeing this with the stimulants. And so uh, I watched a, an entire hour-long talk last year just on this one slide uh, of how they were concerned that we were going to, with our increased prescribing, uh, cause another opioid crisis, except it would be a stimulant crisis. Next slide. So, so let's say we do choose to treat, and we're going to talk about uh, that some of that stuff in a moment. But you know, what are we really hoping for? And and I think we have to understand when we're just in general, we're always hoping to improve people's relationships. Uh, have them have less accents. And again, I think probably in my clinic, the biggest thing is I really like people to be able to work, have a job and keep those relationships, uh, you know, not as tumultuous, right? We want things to to go better and we don't want them to relapse on what might be their drug of choice, right? So, so we want all of these things. So um, it, it's really no different than a, somebody with ADHD who does not have a substance use disorder. We're still hoping, hoping to make life better. We're hoping to make employment better. Next slide. So I think when we talk about that, the next thing is, well, how do we know if we're even succeeding? Uh, and there's been a lot in the literature about how we decide when we are giving stimulants to a patient, if we decide to give them stimulants, how are we going to decide whether or not it's really actually working? Um, and and really, one of the things that's been used uh, with benzodiazepines, I I can tell you that I I did a talk not long ago about benzodiazepines in patients who had opioid use disorder, and my assumption going into that talk was that patients who took benzodiazepines uh, that that they would have more problems, that they would relapse more often, that they would not have be retained in care, and in fact. Most recent studies show that people that are on a benzodiazepine in a buprenorphine program actually uh, stay in recovery longer and actually are, are maintained in, and retained in, in treatment much longer, which was a bit of a surprise to me. And I think that what they're looking at now is, is do we see that same thing if we treat somebody who has a, um, if, who has a stimulant use disorder, are we going to have that same you know, luck, where if we treat that, they're actually going to be better off in treatment and, and have less trouble. I think most of us, when we when we put people on stimulants, uh, we're looking at the, the, are they sticking with their job? Uh, are they able to uh, last eight hours at work, 12 hours at work? You know, are they having more accidents? Are they getting themselves in legal issues? You know, 
And do I ever really look at symptom scales? And and I have to admit, I rarely do, uh, because to me, they're they're pretty subjective. And and when you look at some of the studies done with placebo, it can be very confusing as to whether or not that's going to be helpful. The, doing a urine drug screen is interesting because when we think about this from a harm reduction standpoint, do I expect that forever a patient that's on a stimulant who's also on buprenorphine for their opioid use disorder is my expectation that they will never have a lapse? And the reality is, no, that's not my expectation. So I expect that we may have some bumps in the road. And, and so I don't know if I'm going to measure success uh, as much by their urine as I am by their functioning, uh, their functioning at their job and, and their relationships and the other things. So um, although I do think they're important, and especially in some cases more important if we're concerned about diversion, it's to me that's not a pass or a fail. Next slide. So there was actually a Cochrane review that got redone then. So in 2018, they did a Cochrane review on treatment of ADHD in adults with amphetamines, right? Uh, and these are people without substance use disorders, right? So now we're looking at 19 randomly controlled trials where they gave, uh, where all of them had stimulants and all of them were placebo controlled. So, so patients would get either the real thing or they would get a placebo. And they wanted to really see if it really, you know, if the stimulants really made a difference. This was a big study. There are 18 of these were in the U.S. 10, it was a 10 multi-site uh, study. Um, and the sad part of this whole thing is when they did this review for the Cochrane re re review, 16 to 19 of these were actually pharma funded. Uh, one was publicly funded and two, it was unclear who was funding them. Uh, and so right away, you can see that that we're going to be a little concerned about what the data shows because of who's paying for it and what the expectation of the outcome might be. Next slide. So in these in this Cochrane review, uh, when we look at the outcomes, this was a the average age of the people in all of these studies was about age 35. It was mostly male, mostly Caucasian. And basically what they were looking at was, Number one, did the severity of their ADHD seem to improve when they got stimulants? Uh, number two, how long were they retained in treatment? And, and what were the adverse events that seemed to be related to whether or not the patient was taking um, the stimulant or not? Uh, and again, we talked a little bit about the hypertension, some of the other things that can be a problem, especially as patients get older, clearly more heart disease. Next slide. So, what did they find? Well, first and foremost, and this has been really the case with most of the studies done on, on uh, that have been reviewed for stimulant use, uh, these were really deemed very low uh, quality studies. Um, you know, some of them actually found about a 30% ADHD symptom reduction. And again, this is very subjective, obviously, based on, you know, uh, what patients think, not so much what you can prove. But I, I do think that when I think about my, you know, my patients that are on stimulants, and I, I have a, I wouldn't say a significant amount, but I have a, a quite a few. To me, when they're telling me that, that their job is going better, that they got a promotion, that things are going well, do I think some of these patients do have a response? I do. Um, and so, you know, take that for what it's worth. At thirty percent of people thought that they had better, uh, better outcomes from a symptom standpoint. Interestingly, there was no difference in outcomes of stimulant versus non-stimulant medications. Uh, it seemed to, it seemed not to matter, uh, and there was absolutely no difference in retention in the programs that they that they were in. Uh, and there was actually more adverse events in the amphetam amphetamine group, which we would expect. Uh, because if they were getting the amphetamines, again, they're going to have the tachycardia. They're going to have some of the other signs and symptoms and maybe increased anxiety. Next slide. Um, they they actually repeated this, the methyl, methylphenidate review in 2022. And again, uh, the same comments came out. Uh, there was very much limitations, which was the pharma influence and really similar low quality results. So in in basic message is really there is not good data uh, that that there is improvement. Next slide. So some final thoughts just on ADHD in the adult before we move on to a little bit more messy stuff is again, there's very little data that supports the effectiveness 
of treatment in adults. And this is without substance use disorders, very little evidence. Um, studies to date have had a very high level of pharma influence. And so we have to keep that in mind, just like we, we need to with some of the opioid studies from the old days. Um, and really one of the problems has been that the outcomes they're looking at are very short term, five, five weeks in, in that meta-analysis. And so that really doesn't tell us how somebody does over the next year or two. It's just four or five weeks. Um, and so, you know, in my mind, this does feel a little bit like what we went through with the opioids. Uh, that being said, I, I really do think that careful, careful evaluation of pa patients and thoughtful prescribing should be encouraged. I do believe there are patients that benefit. Um, and it's and is it easier easy to um, predict? That I would say that is a no. It is not easy to predict. Next slide. Uh oh, Katie, your kids are playing with the slides. It did not go. It did not go. Oh I'm nope, on. it did go back up. I'm sorry. Okay. Um. So let's talk about ADHD and substance use disorders in their relationship, because this is this is something also when patients come into your office that you need to understand is that there's clearly a complex relationship between the two. Okay. I think that a lot of people feel like, oh, patients, especially with stimulant use disorders, often are kind of self-medicating uh, their ADHD, and they feel better on methamphetamine, or they do better at their work. When in fact, if you look at what substances people use with ADHD, it is clearly not all methamphetamine. It is spread across the board. And so it's probably not just a case of self-medicating if people have a stimulant use disorder and ADHD. Uh, like many things, I think genetic factors are always something we've got to consider. And I, I do think that we there's a lot of research being done on whether there's these common neural, neuronal pathways that kind of are shared between ADHD and substance use disorders, especially as it, as it kind of revolves around the dopamine. Next slide. So when we look at people who have ADHD and substance use disorders, if you're, there's some things that you should always kind of recognize. And, and especially if you look at patients when they have the onset of their substance use disorder, it is very clearly earlier in patients who have attention deficits, right? Um, the duration of their substance use disorder is typically longer before they seek treatment or get treatment. And they may have more frequent and heavier use when they are using. Um, they're also a group that seems to have much more difficulty achieving remission. And I think that's often the argument as to whether or not they should be treated earlier on with their, with their substance use disorder, also with the stimulants if they have ADHD. Uh, in general, this is a group that has lower treatment retention for substance use disorders, and again, a much higher risk of relapse in the end. Next slide. So when you look at that relationship, uh, there's again, there's clearly that link between ADHD and substance use disorders, but it's very much bi-directional. Um, the substance use population has higher rates of ADHD, and ADHD patients have higher rates of substance use disorders. So it really goes both ways. And really the takeaway is as well is that if we have a patient with one of these problems, they probably should be asked questions or evaluated for the other. And I and I think that probably more so, I mean, when we see people with substance use disorders, again, we're often, they've been on, uh, they've previously been on stimulants. But I think when we look at long-term patients who have been on stimulants, I think it's really important that we're screening them for substance use disorders because they're much more likely to develop them even on a prescribed stimulant. Next slide. So what's the prevalence? Well, if you look at some of the meta-analysis, and there was actually one down done not too long ago, uh, the, the prevalence of ADHD in substance use patients is roughly 20%. But if we break it down into the, what substances they're using, it's, it, it's roughly 19% in patients who use cocaine, about 18% in OUD. Um, the highest prevalence in the alcohol group is roughly 25%. And so Interestingly, again, it's not just people with methamphetamine uh, that uh, that have have these issues with ADHD. I keep having a door open. There we go. So 
Um, there was one small, small study that showed the prevalence was about 43% in patients with methamphetamine use disorder. Uh, but again, some of the bigger studies have really not shown that. Um, I am almost, you know, I'm always really pretty surprised by this last one where when we look at patients with cannabis use disorder, about 35% of patients uh, have ADHD who use that. Uh, and that's got to be a little bit more difficult uh, diagnosis as well, because uh, we all know that the cannabis can really affect cognition. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, patients on stimulants and whether we should also uh, whether we should be concerned about them using um, using the marijuana. Next slide. So our, we have to understand that with the patients who have the substance use disorder, we have the same goals, whether they have a substance use disorder or not. It's really the same things that we're trying to improve in somebody uh, that has a substance use disorder as somebody who does not. We, we, really, we really have the same goals for those patients with the exception of one, really, is that we don't want them to keep entering the, the or re-entering the legal system. And that's something that we just see so often that can be so disruptive to their, uh, to their care and their substance use disorder. And so really, that's a, a big part of it. We want them to have jobs, a stable family. We want them to re be retained, but we also want to keep them out of the legal system. So just a slightly different angle on that. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about what the literature supports for treatment for ADHD and patients with substance use disorder uh, or doesn't support. We know that if a patient has a substance use disorder, they probably should be evaluated for the presence of ADHD. That's clear because of the increased risk. Uh, literature supports that. There's no consensus on what should be treated first. And if you were on uh, early on, Dr. McClure and I were talking about this is like, how quickly do you treat somebody with ADHD if they have a substance use disorder? It used to be a year, then people are saying six months. Are we gonna do better if we start treating it right away? Uh, but there's no consensus. If you look at some of the systematic review in adolescents, uh, it's actually a little bit different. They, they do have some pretty good evidence showing that patients with substance use disorder really had no efficacy from being treated for ADHD. Whereas there is clear evidence that without the substance use disorder, uh, ADHD treatment makes a big difference in adolescence. So at least in that age group, there's just not support. Next slide. Um, there's only limited efficacy noted in adults with both of those uh, diseases. Um, and that was only in two trials. Now, uh, I will mention this because it's really pretty interesting. If you look at um, these two trials, they used very, very high doses of stimulants. And at the end of the these papers, they talked a little bit about why they felt they saw some improvement in ADHD symptoms with these higher doses. And they felt it was because of the long-term use of these patients with methamphetamine and opioids that, that the system needed more of that from a dopamine standpoint to actually improve how they were doing. And so uh, those are the only studies that showed it, but they were at doses I think often we would uh, we would balk at uh, as they were quite high. Uh, there was actually a, a recent study that showed a very robust association with both short and long-term retention and treatment, but in contrast, the previous Cochrane meta-analysis again showed no improvement with treatment at all. And so there's uh, there's just no consensus about whether or not that is uh, you know something we can support. Next slide. So based on the evidence, what do we, you know, do we treat? Um, and these are just strictly my thoughts. Uh, they don't represent anybody else's thoughts after spending a lot of time digging through all this literature. Um, I think we have to understand that every patient's situation is different. And really when I see these patients, you know, I'm looking for what I can do to improve their function at work and in their relationships. Um, I often see patients, and I think everybody on this call could probably tell me a story about a patient who is 60-some years old and is on stimulants and watches TV all day and is on disability, Has and they're not working, they're not taking care of kids, but they're put on a stimulant for their attention. I'm not looking for that in my practice. I'm looking for situations where I want to help them with their job, with their college, with their work. And so... 
Um, it, it's really, for me, I think every situation is different. Um, and I think that we have to take a history that's really thorough to kind of see what we can do or whether or not we can make a difference. I think one of the, you know, in a perfect world, we would be looking for those patients that we had some, at least some evidence that they had symptoms that started before the age of seven. And that, and it's always nice that they've had an evaluation that you can pull up in Epic and that you could see when they were six or seven and they had no, you know, really no understanding of why they were being screened or what was being uh, considered for medication, that they clearly had the problem when they're young. Those patients, I have a much easier time moving on to treatment. When we, you know, I think we always have to consider the symptoms as being easily available online. And we always have to consider that's, that patients may prep. And when I say that, I, I say that not in a mean way. I think that, again, often patients truly believe they have an attention problem and they just need to convince you. And often they will they will go a little overboard trying to make sure that, that they get the medication they truly feel they need. Next slide. Um, what about urine drug screens? Now, I think that that in our clinic, we do urine drug screens pretty routinely. I, I think I'm, uh, again, I'm a harm reduction, kind of middle of the road type person. So, you know, for me, it's not trying to get people out of my program or throw them out. It's more to have a conversation. I think that if we ever have concerns about diversion and diversion of the stimulants is extremely high, I think it's reasonable to occasionally do those counts in patients that we're concerned about. Um, I think that the treatment with stimulants should be considered, again, it's that functional improvement. Now, marijuana, uh, to me, is a bit of an issue, and it's something that I've just started to address recently. Uh, there was a lot uh, at ASAM last year talking about whether or not if somebody is on a stimulant, whether we should, whether we should continue their stimulants if they're using marijuana, which clearly may negate the improvements we're seeing with the stimulant. Uh, and I do think this is really about patient education. Uh, I just had a college student that I saw. I've had a couple of college students here lately where we've had really pretty extensive conversations about their cognition and their use of marijuana and, and often their sleep, because so many people believe it helps their sleep uh, when, in fact, it, it actually messes up your REM sleep. So um, marijuana, to me, is one of those things that I think we each have to think about in patients that are on stimulants and whether or not we feel comfortable still giving people stimulants if they're regular marijuana uh, users, uh, whether it's prescription um, or not. You know, I think some people have that, the same kind of concerns with stimulants and benzos, benzodiazepines. If we have somebody on stimulants and suddenly they feel anxious all the time and we put them on a, a benzo, are we just treating the side effect of the stimulant? So. Um, we, we need to kind of think about, you know, what are we doing with the first medicine? Is the second medicine really necessary? Next slide. So I think um, if you decide to treat, um, you know, the previous guidelines were actually about a year in recovery before you treat. I think that's probably a little too long, in my opinion. Uh, it wasn't really date based on a lot of data that I'm aware of. Uh, I do think I, I try and wait a number of months and I try and get as much information on the patient as I possibly can. Uh, sometimes that's in the form of a paper. Uh, well, there's no such thing as paper, but things in the, uh, you know, things in the Epic or things that I can find that they previously had done, like neuropsych testing. Uh, but sometimes it can be helpful if we have another family member or somebody that can give us, you know, an idea of what they were like when they were younger. I think you have to let the patient know what your plan of action would be if the patient relapses on any medications that they're that are on any uh, substance that they've used in the past. Are we going to continue this medication or not? And I do think that it really depends on the on the substance they relapse on whether I would continue that. And and I think also it's like you know phone a friend. You know I have uh, people that I can call at at the psychiatry. Um, uh, at, at our at our at the plaza, and I can kind of chat with them about some of these cases. And I have whether or not I'm I'm thinking clearly about restarting some of these things. Uh, but don't be afraid to ask somebody else what they think about a particular case. Next slide. So here's the summary. Um, and, and in a way, this is like an episode of Seinfeld. Uh, you know, this is kind of a talk about nothing really because there's not great data. Uh, that really helps us a lot. And so uh, just like Seinfeld being a show about nothing, 
in, in, a, in a way, this was a talk about nothing because we don't have great data. Um, we only know that ADHD is real and it clearly affects patients with substance use disorders and those without. Um, we know that for the most part, there's good evidence to treat ADHD uh, probably in the younger uh, patients, but not so much in, in adults. And it's really lacking when we look at people with comorbid substance use disorders. I do think there's going to need, need to be a lot more research, and, and hopefully that will help us make better decisions in the future. And so from my standpoint, uh, you know, for me, it's like I look at each patient very uh, closely, and I make dis, uh, decisions based on that particular patient. Uh, and that's kind of been kind of been my rule. So next slide. I don't think there's any more slides. So, so, so if you want to take that down, Katie, um, I, I'm happy to entertain questions. I'm happy to entertain comments. And I, I don't know if Matt, uh, we have Dr. McClure on, and and we had a little conversation about this before. If any of the uh, psychiatry people want to weigh in, I'd love that. You have something in the chat from Dana Farley, Kurt. Um, you didn't mention these, so wondering about your thoughts. Um, CBT for ADHD or cognitive behavioral therapy. And did the trials you mentioned include CBT, given the relapse or temptations caution about fake Adderall pills? Yeah, and I don't recall uh, the studies talking about CBT. And maybe Dr. McClure would know more whether or not that's a, you know, from an ADHD standpoint, but that's something that's been effective. Comments, Matt? Look, Kurt, excellent. Oh. Oop, you're muted. Look, excellent talk, Kurt. Um, I was going to mention that I really, and I know you do this too, but really tease out, do they have other comor comorbidities? Like, as you know, with SUDs, there's often PTSD. And you start talking to them about their ACEs and L6, 8, 10, before they're 12 years old. And, you, and of course, they have PTSD and can't focus. Or do they have an underlying generalized anxiety disorder or something like that? Um, my general approach has been to make sure that they have an ongoing relationship with a therapist. So I've got a second set of eyeballs seeing them uh, two to four times a month, monitoring them as well. And often I would use non-stimulants first. And if they're just new to treatment, um, I would accept them having their primary um, substance use disorder uh, for their uh, treatment person as that contact person. But um, by insisting that they get into therapy, and like CBT is an excellent adjunct for ADHD. Um, they've got... Um, even CBT for insomnia for the people who are not sleeping. Um, but that buys me several weeks before I even have to even consider a, um, a stimulant. So they're either engaged in treatment and they're actually dedicated to their recovery or they've kind of fallen by the wayside before it's time to even consider a stimulant. Yeah, That's that was pretty much my approach. Yeah. Do you, you know, it's interesting too, Matt, if you think about patients like, especially now with fentanyl, boy, that first few months, they're in just such turmoil as well. Yeah. You know, it, it they just, boy, it takes a long time for them to, to really kind of plane out, if you will. Yeah. And and I, su I suspect that that, you know, from a relapse standpoint, so you still would wait, wait a while before you'd add the stimulant. Yes. Okay. Yep. But and you know, it's particularly with the alcohol use disorder, because their sleep is so disturbed and their cognition is so disturbed for weeks, if not months, of getting sober. Perfect. Do you want to read the question? Are there other comments or questions here? Yeah. So Jody and Ashley both made comments in the chat. Do either one of you want to unmute and ask or discuss further, or do you want me to read it? Um, this is Jody. Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Yep. So I work in uh, Mora, Wellia, and I, I worked in psychiatry for probably a couple of decades, I guess. But um, I see patients here at Wellia Clinic. Uh, we get a lot of patients wanting uh, their ADHD treated. And I agree. Uh, with, it seemed like with the in the last four to five years, there was like an influx of everybody coming in asking the question to primary care and then being referred to psychiatry. 
I know I've read a lot of stuff that suggested that people that maybe always, you know, had questioned the ADHD for a long time, but then in the midst of a pandemic with increasing rates of depression and anxiety, that kind of came to the head. And then they were struggling with stuff like school, work, relationships, maybe some substance use, uh, relapsing. Um, so, I mean, what you described today sounds a lot like what we're seeing here. Um, I also, I prefer to send patients to somebody for kind of a, a workup for ADHD. Uh, I trust a psychologist. I put his information on the website. He has an online platform and he does, uh, it's a computer-based test. Um, I think it's a, it's a test of uh, attention or something. I forget the full name of the test, but I trust him. He can get patients in pretty quickly. I think the out-of-pocket cost is like, 180 to 200 dollars but probably money well spent to, to actually get it evaluated and even if he doesn't think it's adhd he'll give some kind of comments on what he thinks it is like perhaps untreated sleep apnea or or just lots of anxiety which is very helpful for me to decide if i if i'm going to treat this condition uh with either a I mean, I, my preference would be to start a non-stimulant if possible but sometimes patients have tried non-stimulants and then I'll go to a, I'll go to a stimulant, but. Do you want to go ahead and read those other ones, Aaron? Sure. Ashley states, I find that once a stimulant is prescribed, it complicates the patient provider relationship because patients now have a reason to be untruthful regarding slips or use of substances and they don't want to jeopardize their refills. Yeah. And I, and I think that the important part, and I kind of mentioned that, is like in my clinic, honestly, uh, an, an unexpected urine is never really a reason to to panic. I, I you know, we sit down and we kind of talk about it. Um, you know, depending on the situation, they I might hold it for a while, but it's not it's not necessarily mean oh you're you're done. Um, again, we have to always remember addiction is kind of a chronic relapsing disease, and I my expectation is we're going to have a little bit of trouble. Uh, I, I do think that, yeah, I mean, you, you're right that people are there. They want to, they they don't want to lose the meds. And so they may, they may not always be completely truthful, but I, I think if you portray the fact that you're, you're not trying, you're not the police, I'm not the police. I'm not trying to catch anybody at anything. So that's just kind of my perspective. I don't know if anybody else has a thought. This is Matt. I found the same thing with Suboxone, too. It can't change a relationship. And it gets to be that hound and fox type of thing. And But your term using expected, unexpected, I think that's very, very important that we don't use the pejorative of a dirty urine. Because now you're a bad person. So, yeah. I just had the conversation recently too, you know, they brought up, well, what if your patients refer to their urine drug screen as dirty and clean? And I talked with her saying, you know, educate your patients too, because they help to reduce stigma and, you know, they're stigmatizing themselves. So kind of bring them up to speed on the proper language to use so they can accept their disease as a chronic relapsing chronic illness. Um, Cole asks a really good question in the chat. How reliable is objective computer-based testing in the setting of early recovery, the first several months of sobriety? Question mark. My answer would be, I have no idea. Anybody have a thought? I think most testers will say, I want them sober for six to eight months prior to testing. Um, certainly in St. Cloud area, the neuropsych testers, some of them actually demand or insist on having a year of sobriety before they'll do neuropsych testing. That's an eight hundred dollar battery, and they don't want to waste the the money or their time prematurely. Interesting. Other comment. Other questions or thoughts? We're we have a few minutes. If anybody else has any other thoughts, I I do. And sorry if you alluded to this in your presentation already, but how many patients, and maybe this is a good question for Dr. McClure too, how many patients that you're seeing with methamphetamine use disorder do you feel actually would qualify for diagnosis of ADHD? Is that pretty common? 
Yeah, and I think in, I think that that one small study was like forty percent, but I don't know if I anecdotally. I, I don't know, Matt. Do you have a thought? I don't think it's that high. I think there's a lot of associated PTSD and yeah. other comorbidities than yeah. than ADHD. I I really go back to what were you like as a child, and I know obviously I don't do Connors, but if I can get a hold of those things or get um, kind of ask that questionnaire of their current partner or a sibling who knows them well, um, that can be really helpful too. But I, yeah, the, the idea that it's so high, I think it's just kind of a, I don't know if that's mm -hmm. um, press pushing this stuff or like I said, pharma pushing this stuff. Yeah. There's also a question about do those who are treated with stimulant medication for ADHD experience tolerance and or withdrawal? Um, I do think just like any stimulant, they get they'll get some withdrawal symptoms if they they've been on a little bit higher uh, higher dose. Um, I don't know about tolerance. I I guess I'm not aware. No. Anybody aware of that? I don't think you get tolerance to them. It's not like you have to. Once you found a 30, 30 milligrams of Ritalin twice a day is fine. It's going to be fine in a year or two. It's interesting because I, I think, too, that when I think about patients that I see now, uh, I had one patient that asked for a dose reduction, actually, yeah. two. And, and to me, that's like so comforting. You know, they thought, they said, you know, I don't know if I need to be on quite this much. Can I try a lower dose? And then they come back and say, you know, I think it's doing just as well. I, I want to stay there, even without, you know, the hypertension or some of the other things. So, um, you know, those are the, always the patients I tend to, I tend to feel a lot better about that are evaluating their own dose and and really want to be on the lowest dose that's effective, right? And I, and I have that conversation with them. We want to be on the lowest dose we can. These aren't without side effects long term. So, all right. Any anything else before we go? Um, Sean Tweeden has a really nice um, comment. Um, that our patients in the Minnesota jails use meth because it's cheaper than their ADHD meds or ran out. Yeah. Um, my uh, my response was, is always, uh, why are you in jail again? So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well said. Well said. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I actually do have a question. Um, my name is Alana. Um, I was just um, wondering, okay, so people who are being treated with ADHD and they do have the history um as a child and they do go to meth is there some type of treatment for them using meth like as the suboxone and things like that like it's a lot safer with nowadays with the meth being mixed with fentanyl and all this other garbage like the providers look at that as like something to help with the substance use disorder for that yeah. And, you know, I, I can't remember if that was prior to everybody kind of getting on. We we were talking a little bit about, you know, from a harm reduction standpoint, there are people in this country that are treating methamphetamine use disorder with methylphenidate and some of the other stimulants uh, because it's a known entity and they feel like at least the patient knows what they're getting and they can control and the physician can control the the dosing. Uh, that's currently not something I'm doing. Uh, I don't know if there's anybody on here that's doing that. Um, there is no Suboxone kind of a medicine that we would use for uh, methamphetamine. It would have to be another similar type stimulant or non-stimulant, right? Some of the other things mm -hmm. that we can try. Okay. So. Yeah, because I know like for Adderall, you know, that's like similar with it and um I just feel like that would help along in the long run for harm reduction. Yeah. But, yeah. And, you know, at, at some point, I don't know how everybody else feels. I mean, at some point that may be a standard, uh, at least now it's being explored. Um, and, and some people uh, feel like it works better and that you get uh, people in retention in treatment centers and they have less, you know, again, long-term side effects because at the doses they're using methamphetamine, uh, it shortens your life, clearly. And can mm -hmm. we put you on a lower dose of a prescribed medication, avoid the adverse uh, reactions, and you'll do better long-term? Um, exactly. Yeah, that's a I question that's yet to be answered. 
Okay. Yeah, because I, I actually am I'm an intern here at um, Ramsey County Detox, and we're getting a lot of um, clients coming in, you know, with meth and fentanyl, and they don't know what they're getting, and they're getting mixed with ecstasy and things like that, and you know they're going they're going through psychosis, and it's just, you know, I feel like it's a lot safer if like like for the suboxone, you know, they give that for opiates, um, meth they can give them stimulants, but, you know, kind of do it as a tapering dose. So, so they're not going through those withdrawals as bad. And that's yeah. just, and I, you know, and I'll be honest with you in the current, currently the way things are run, uh, getting Suboxone in jails is like number one, um, whether we could convince people in a jail system to start uh-huh. doing uh, a stimulant. Uh, I think that's, that's a ways out. And, and again, the data is not there, but, Again, there are people doing it, so you're not wrong. There are, it is being explored. So, okay. Like and then also on. for the suboxone as as well. Sorry. Um, do you know if the jails are providing um, medications after they discharge? You know, they're out of jail. Uh, are you talking? People that's are- where. It's, yeah, because it's that, that's where a lot of the inmates are. You know, they're going through overdose because they think they can come back to the same amount they're using in the past yeah. when they get out. And yeah, it's clearly getting better. And frankly, that's why we're having this nice little boot camp in a couple of weeks then we're mm-hmm. talking fun and having these conversations with uh, with jails. I mean, clearly your your risk of leaving the jail if you've got an opioid use disorder, you're twenty times twenty nine times more likely to die of an overdose when you leave. If you don't get meds, so yeah, yeah it's a big thing. So mm-hmm. okay, that's all. Perfect. Thank you for your questions. Any other thoughts or comments before we go? A question for Zachary: When you said uh, we do it in prison, were you referring to um, a stimulant or suboxone? A stimulant. They. It was so obvious that so many of these people were. In having behaviors that were getting them in trouble. The common was out of area, right? So they get flagged and sent to segregation. And we knew this person wasn't doing anything bad, but there's plenty of studies and like, this is profound. This is a, this is a 10 year old kid walking around. Um, and so they, in certain cell units and areas, they allow this to happen. And sure enough, the people weren't having those issues. It was pretty legit. So that, yeah, that was a uh, stimulants. Okay. Thank you. There's a comment I just talked to the Dakota County Drug Task Force, Suboxone treatment in jail and one week RX on discharge. Yep. So so again, some Dakota is one of the places that's been doing it a lot. Hennepin County has a very robust program. Uh there have been a couple of pretty big programs uh down down in Olmstead, I think they're starting. So it's it's coming. And again, I think that uh with time. So Matt, I really appreciate your help. Dr. McClure was uh, was was not recruited for this. He came on and and we recruited him. So uh, once he showed, so thanks again, uh, Dr. McClure, for your help. Excuse the appearance, but I'm enjoying retirement. So. <laughs> uh, all right, everybody. Well, we'll see you next week, and we're going to talk next week about marijuana and how to deal with patients using marijuana and what things might be a problem if with their marijuana use. So uh, tune in next week, and then. Uh, the week after uh, a national speaker. So tons of fun.